and it is seven o'clock. We said we would start right on time. We have a lot that we're trying to cram into this hour and a half. And on behalf of the Echo Justice Collaborative, I want to welcome everybody tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Echo Justice Collaborative, members of the Collaborative have been working on the related issues of climate and racial and social justice for decades. And we know that there are many friends in the yearly meeting who aren't part of the collaborative who've been doing that work too. And we know that you come at it from lots of different angles and different ways that you have, different solutions that you have been um, addressing this with. So we're really happy tonight to be presenting this workshop, uh, hosting, co-hosting it. It's a workshop that was developed by the Concord Quarters Climate Action Working Group and it presents an approach to both climate change and biodiversity loss that any friends meeting or school or institution can um, take advantage of, whether you have a little bit of land or a lot of land. So we hope that you find this really um, informative and exciting and that you'll come back to the next one in April. Thank you so much and welcome everyone again. Uh, my name is Paula Klein. I'm from Westtown Monthly Meeting. I've worn a lot of hats over the years in terms of climate and biodiversity work, and it's really a pleasure for me to be the facilitator for tonight's meeting. This is the first in a series of, now I'm going to have my first technical difficulty, which is I'm trying to move to my next slide. There we go. Whew. Um, I, um, this is the first in a series of four programs that we are, we've are we organized to share resources regarding the role we can all play in putting the healing of our relationship with the natural world front and center. It's designed, as Ruth mentioned, by the Concord Quarter Climate Action Working Group and the Ecojustice Collaborative as part of a ministry, climate action ministry, that derives from a set of from a set of recommendations in PYM, Philadelphia Early Meeting, known as the Climate Sprint Report. And as friends, uh, we wanted to host this so that all friends, meetings, schools, retirement communities could embrace a commitment this year, if possible, to practices that support the Commonwealth of Life. And through these uh, programs that you see on the screen that we've laid out a series of orientations to help you. And we hope other faith communities will join us in that effort. So tonight, you are uh, in the first, which is going to look at landscaping policies and why this matters and why it's important to do now. And then we'll focus on a specific certification, which is the National Wildlife Federation certification, which is both for schools and for houses of worship. In April, we'll be looking at the Homegrown National Park and the Audubon Bird Friendly Certification. And then in June, we'll come back together to look at what those of us who have woodlands or woodlots or actual forests might do by learning about something called the Carbon Forest Project and other forest regeneration opportunities. Then during the summer and fall, we know that a lot of Quaker organizations will host tours. So you can see for yourself, what does it actually look like to embody this in your own grounds? And we hope again, other faith communities will either join and, and participate in our tours or create their own. So tonight's session, we are going to have an orientation to ecological landscaping from Doug Tallamy to understand why what we do matters and why it's so important for us to act soon. Then we're gonna review some basic policy options you might have and learn directly from Roy Mano from the Kendall Crosslands Retirement Community in Kennett Township to see what that looks like in operation. And then we'll, we'll finish with an introduction to the National Wildlife Federation certification, Greening Sacred Grounds. And then we'll have a little bit at the end of our next steps, which we hope will be pretty straightforward. And, encourage you to come. I want to thank you that often when we talk about stewardship, we're referring to finances and how we make decisions around spending related to our buildings, our brick and mortar. And there's an increased focus on lowering our carbon footprint by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and 
that makes so much sense. We should be doing that. And while we don't often think of ourselves as large property owners, as faith communities, we actually control a surprising number of buildings using fossil fuels. We hope you are all aware that for the first time, I'll say that again, for the first time, nonprofits, which we all are, can take advantage of subsidies for transitioning to renewable energy. So we'll be sharing resources with everyone about how to learn more about that when we send out the materials about this workshop as well. But in this program, <clears throat> we're focusing on the growing recognition of the need to consider our neighbors in the natural world. We have a responsibility to all of God's creatures that surround us to keep their habitat, their homes hospitable. So we're gonna hear from superstar Doug Tallamy's University of Delaware's presentation entitled, What's the Rush? As an orientation to ecological landscaping. <coughs> we're gonna talk about what the rush is. <clears throat> but first I'm going to start with a story. This is a, a, a thing, a being I saw in my uh, yard last summer. Looks like a fecal sac that a, a bird dropped out of its nest. If you take a closer look, you say, well, gee, maybe that's a spider. Look at it at night. Indeed, it is a spider. It's a bola spider. And this is how bola spiders hunt. They drop a single strand of silk. Somebody's got a mute out there, I think. Uh, and they put a little sticky, sticky glob of glue at the end. And it looks like they're going to go fishing with it. Well, I didn't think uh, this spider would be able to catch anything, but a few minutes later it did. A moth flew in and, and got caught on its sticky glob of glue, wraps it up in silk, has a nice meal. Uh, and if it does that enough time, it has the energy to create a, an egg mass. And that's exactly what this spider did. As a matter of fact, she made three egg masses. So how does she catch a moth like this? Well, she's actually releasing the sex pheromone of particular species of moth. I want to know what the species was. So I unwrapped the things that she was catching and it turned out it's the bronze cutworm. She caught 10 bronze cutworms in a, in a row in my yard and I've got bronze cutworms and the caterpillars that create a bronze cutworm because I've got goldenrod. That's their famous, their favorite uh, host plant. Uh, and the tree I was looking at was an oak tree. Uh, which produced this beautiful moth, a dot line white. And I've got dot line whites uh, from produced by this tree in my yard because I didn't rake the leaves away because there's a dot line white uh, cocoon in this, this little leaf mass right here. And there it is. I'm sure you saw it right away. Here it is up close. If you rake them away, you've just thrown away that beautiful moth. I've got evening primrose moths in my yard because I've got evening primrose. So the moth comes and, and spends the day with its head stuffed in the flower. It's very cute. I've got zebra swallowtails because I've got pawpaws that I planted there for that exact reason to create, to, uh, <clears throat> attract that beautiful moth. It would take me a week or more to describe all of the species that are now calling our property home because of the plants that we have put back there. It would not take me a week, it wouldn't take me very long at all to describe all the species that are living in a landscape like this, a typical suburban landscape. There is no goldenrod, so there are no bronze cutworms, so there are no bola spiders. There are no oaks, so there are no dot line whites, whites or hundreds of other species. There are no pawpaws, so there's Oh, give me a break. I don't know why I do that. There we go. So there are no zebra swallowtails. Sorry about that. There are no enotheras, no, no evening primroses. Uh, so uh, we have no, no uh, evening primrose moths. There is very little life that can live in a typical landscape like this. And of course, you know that. But that is why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines. The insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. A third of our North American bird population is already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife is gone. One million species face extinction in the next 20 years. 40% of Earth's plants face extinction. These are big problems, folks. These are big problems. And they're problems because we have not shared the planet with the natural world. We're taking the resources for ourselves. And that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write The Sixth Great Extinction. I'll bet she would have been happier if she didn't have to write that book. Jason Hinkle says, biodiversity loss is such a strange euphemism for the mass destruction of non-human beings. Uh, it's the genocide of nature is really what we're talking about. 
So what's our reaction to these sobering statistics? People are actually studying that. Richard Hobbs uh, wrote a paper about it. He likens the uh, our, our uh, reactions to the five stages of grief that we experience when we get typically a, a, a news of a terminal illness. First, there's denial. We certainly have plenty of people denying that we have a problem at all. Then there's anger. I feel a little bit of that sometimes. Bargaining, depression, I feel a little bit of that sometimes too. And then the final stage of grief is acceptance. And this is where I take issue. Uh, acceptance is too easily equated with giving up. Uh, and giving up is not an option, folks, because, because nature is not optional. We absolutely need it. So we need a sixth step here, and that is action. That's what Homegrown National Park's all about, taking action. And we do have existing national parks, uh, and they were created primarily because they had exquisite scenery. They were beautiful places. Teddy Roosevelt said, we've got to preserve these places because that's good administration. Um, natural beauty is a national asset uh, and recreation produces good, good citizenship. So our parks uh, were, were created largely because they were pretty places uh, in which we could play. And that's why we only have about 12% of the US that's formally protected. These dark green areas are where we have our major parks because there's not all that many places that are exquisitely beautiful where we can play. What's happening outside the parks though has been appalling. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural resources disappears to development. Development, I think it's the most oxymoronic word we have certainly in, in the field of ecology. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn. That's an area the size of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Uh, and an even deader scape is what we've paved over. We've paved over an area larger than Ohio. There are 2 million acres of golf courses. That's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. Uh, and we could go on talking about many other statistics. Now, Matt Lee Ashley has observed that evaluating the condition of nature is a bit like watching a leaking pipe. If a person focuses on each drop as it falls to the floor, the leak doesn't seem very damaging. But if you leave for a day and you come back, your room is gonna be full of water. And that's exactly what has happened. And we talk about an extinction crisis. It is indeed an extinction crisis, but uh, I don't think extinction is the right metric that we should use. We have an extinction crisis, but we have, to, we have to think about the degradation of common species. Species like the picture you're seeing here, this is the uh, American chestnut. It used to be the dominant tree uh, in our, our Eastern deciduous forest from Maine all the way to Georgia. It's not extinct yet, but it's functionally extinct. It is, it is wiped out by the um, chestnut blight. The rusty patch bumblebee used to be one of the most common bees in North America. Uh, now it's a big deal if anybody sees even one of them. So it's functionally extinct. Beavers, now we do, and beavers are making somewhat of a comeback, but they used to be common in every stream system of the entire country. Their elimination drastically changed the hydrology of the entire country and it wasn't for the better. So we're really talking about defaunation. That's the real problem. It's local and it's everywhere. Enter E.O. Wilson. Uh, Harvard Emeritus, everybody knows Edward O. Wilson, spent his life uh, studying lots of things, but he certainly was trying to save biodiversity. And his probably his biggest contribution in that regard was this book that he wrote in 2016, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. And in this book, he, he uh, noted that in order to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature, we're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. And if we don't do that, it's going to just dis disappear everywhere. And he spent most of the book uh, talking about the science that supports that statement. And then he ended the book. Um, he didn't tell us a whole lot about how we were going to do that. Now, fortunately, and, and somewhat to my surprise, people are actually listening uh, to his, his Half Earth Initiative. Uh, the UN has, has uh, created a global initiative initiative first the 30 by 30 we're going to save 30 percent of the planet by 2030 and that's step one going towards uh, 50 by 50. so the un is doing what the un does they get a bunch of people together and they're they're negotiating uh how we're going to protect biodiversity and it's not going any better than all the negotiations about climate change have have gone can you imagine negotiating whether or not we're going to save life on on planet earth well that's exactly what the un is doing um, and everybody's got this notion in their eye, in their head that 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 we're actually going to save 50% of the Earth uh, as as pristine ecosystems. 
How could this be possible? Well, it can't be possible. It's not possible. Half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture. Uh, certainly not pristine. We've got 7.9, soon to be 8 billion people in the other half, uh, along with all of our, our infrastructure and our detritus. Uh, there isn't 50% of planet Earth that is still pristine. So how can we realize EO's dream? Well, uh, actually, I think, I think the answer is obvious. We're going to need a new approach to conservation, and it's not about putting pristine areas aside. It's about restoring the areas that we have destroyed. And we're going to do that by finding ways for humans and nature to coexist. In the, in the past, we've had this idea that they cannot coexist. Uh, but what I, what I have been arguing for a long time now is that um, coexisting with nature is now the only viable option that's left to us. We absolutely have to find ways to do that. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Uh, so we now need to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. And I'm not just talking about conserving what's there, I'm talking about restoring what is already lost. So in other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but thrive. So if protected areas uh, are, are not large enough, we're gonna have to practice conservation outside of those protected areas, outside of preserved areas. So we're gonna have to practice conservation in areas like this, but also in areas like this. And as Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young once said, uh, if you can't be with the nature you love, love the nature you're with. I might break into song if I think about that too much. Where are we talking about? We're talking about private property. 78% of the US is, is privately owned. Um, and 85% and of the US east of the Mississippi is, is privately owned. So we have to practice conservation on private property. And uh, lawn is the low hanging fruit. It's really what got me thinking about uh, Homegrown National Park to begin with. We have more than 40 million acres of lawn. That's a 2005 statistic. So we know it's bigger than that now. Um, and you know, it is, a, it is a leftover from the class system, the aristocracy of Europe were the only ones who could afford lawn. And so it's a status symbol and we love our status symbols dedicated to an ecological deadscape. So I know we need, we need lawn for high status and we need lawn to display our, our Halloween decorations. Uh, but what if, if we replanted half the area that is now in lawn? That's the idea I had way back in 1987. That would give us 20 million acres that we could put towards conservation right at home. We could create homegrown national park, which will be huge. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Man. And of all those parks, it's still less than 20 million acres. So homegrown national park will be the biggest park in the country. I started talking about that in my talks for years. Uh, and then I finally, uh, when I wrote Nature's Best Hope, I included it as a chapter. But, um, you know, talk is cheap. That's pretty much all I do. Uh, and then I did meet Michelle and she talked about how, how, uh, <laughs> how this started. She came up to me after a talk and said, you're, you're just talking to the choir. And I said, yes, it's only the choir who invites me. And she said, well, you're not going to succeed unless you get beyond the choir. You have to use social media, you've got to use marketing, and you've got to do all the things that, that I know she was correct. I said, I don't do those things. And she said, I do do those things. So, so let's do it. And that's where homegrownnationalpark.org came from. Um, the ideas you see expressed here are, are all Michelle's. What are we asking in Homegrown National Park? We're saying we need to reduce the area in lawn. That is the low hanging fruit. We've got to put more natives into our landscapes, and we've got to remove the invasive species that are already there. Our product is national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are. We're gonna change the culture. We're gonna recognize that nature's not optional. It's not something we, we should do. It's something we absolutely must do. And it's everybody's responsibility to do it. And the map, once it's uh, fully operational, will be allow us to measure our conservation progress. It'll be a powerful scientific tool. Homegrown National Party is going to convert hope to action. We need action. It's aspirational. It doesn't rely on governmental support. Not that we would turn it down if anybody offers it. It's going to merge existing conservation efforts like Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones, 
Uh, we're not, you know, it's no paid membership here. We're not stealing members from anybody. We're uniting them so that we can all have one visual in terms of our progress. And that visual will reveal holes in our biological corridors uh, that, that uh, we're going to need in order to connect the wild places that remain. So what we're envisioning is uh, something like the COVID maps you see in the New York Times, where uh, each county will be colored in with the progress it's making. This is, this is a simulation, of course. But we're talking about a, a science-based grassroots call to action that can address the two major problems we have in this, in this uh, on planet Earth. We've got climate change, but we've got a biodiversity crisis. And Homegrown National Park will address both of those simultaneously. So what's the rush? Well, remember these statistics. Um, they're not, they're not waiting. They're coming every day. Uh, there is great urgency in enacting this homegrown national park solution. We've got 48 million residential landscapes in the U.S. If we add 1,000 properties to homegrown national park each month, it sounds like great progress, but it'll take us 4,083 years to reach all of them. So that's not quite fast enough. If we look at that in terms of, of property size, the average lot size in the US is three tenths of an acre. So if we add 1,000 acres to homegrown national park each month, it'll take us 1,200 years to convert all landscapes. Ooh, somebody's got to mute. So who's gonna help homegrown national park make this rapid transition? Uh, the problem is most people do not garden themselves. They just hire somebody. It's not that they don't like nature or they don't like gardening. They don't have time. They're raising kids or doing other things. So they hire somebody. So what we need to do is create the person that they're going to hire. We need to create a, a team of, of skilled ecological landscapers. Uh, there are groups doing that now. We need more of them. They need to do it faster. Every place I go to give a talk, people say, who can I hire? And I usually don't know. Uh, but once this team is in place, these people are gonna have the information that, that everybody needs. Ecological landscapers are going to know that every landscape has four ecological responsibilities. It's gotta support food webs so that we have functioning ecosystems. It's got to sequester carbon, get that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It has to manage our watershed, excuse me, and it has to support pollinators. And they're gonna know that lawn accomplishes none of those goals. So our fascination with the lawn is going to end. Uh, they're going to know that plant choice matters. There are three kinds of plants out there, contributors, non-contributors, and detractors. A contributing plant is, is one that's helping to enhance local ecosystems. It's going to be a native. Some are much better than others. Uh, a non-contributor would be something like, like ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. It's not an invasive plant, but it contributes very little to ecosystem function. And a detractor would be an invasive plant like calorie pear, uh, which becomes an ecological tumor. It escapes and, and um, pushes out the native plants in our functioning ecosystems. Uh, ecological landscapers are going to know that, that caterpillars are an essential component to our landscapes. They are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. And they're gonna know that keystone plants are, are keystone plants because they support the most caterpillars. Just 14% of our native plants are, are supporting 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs, which makes keystone plants essential components of the ecological houses that we're building. They're the support system. Our house isn't gonna stand up with, without keystone plants. We've been trying to build ecological houses out of wallpaper for the last hundred years, and that doesn't work. And they're also gonna know that uh, uh, insects are the little things that run the world. Uh, E.O. Wilson's famous, famous statement. They're going to know that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the particular plants for which they have the adaptations to, to get around their, their particular defenses. So think monarch butterflies eating toxic milkweeds. Very few other insects can do that. You take away the milkweeds, you take away the monarch butterflies. They're gonna know that we need pollinators, but they're also gonna know it's not because they're pollinating a third of our, our crops. You hear that every day on the news. It's actually about a 12th of our crops, but then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. Everybody needs pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Losing our pollinators is not an option unless we want to lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. 
They're also going to know that light pollution and mosquito fogging are two of the major causes of insect declines, uh, and they're fairly easily reversed. If we put in yellow bulbs instead of our white bulbs, it's going to de decrease insect loss to light pollution, and we can, of course, fire mosquito joe pretty easily. They're going to know that, that uh, tiny properties can be very important in terms of conservation. Uh, it can happen on any size property, right from a flower pot on up. And most of all, they're going to know uh, that conservation works. It's going to make it going to make it worthwhile. And I'll give you just one example of, of what's happened at uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. This is what it looked like when we moved in. It was part of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre lots. Uh, and it had been mowed for hay. Very little life there. As a matter of fact, where it wasn't mowed for hay, it was it was uh, nothing but invasive plants. That's my wife Cindy there getting rid of these invasives. It can be done. This is what it looks like today. Uh, and once our research showed that that uh, the number of moth species you have in your local food web is a great index for how how healthy that food web is, how complex and stable it is. I started counting the moth species that have come to our barren landscape since we moved in, and I am up to 1,140 species of moths, um, which is, that's 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state of, of Pennsylvania. They are there because we put the plants back. And because so many of them are types of bird food, we now support 60 species of birds that have bred on our property, not flew by, but bred. But uh, is reducing the lawn enough? That was the low-hanging fruit, but uh, if you look at the numbers, there are issues with that. We've got 1.9 billion acres uh, in the lower 48 states. Less than 12% or 228 million acres are protected, so not very much. That leaves 1.6 billion acres unprotected. Now, 78% of that, or 1.3 billion acres, is privately owned. If Homegrown National Park restores 20 million of those acres, that's only 1.53% of what really needs to be restored. So our goals are too modest. We have to increase them uh, by doing more than shrinking the lawn. Most of our privately owned land is in small woodlots, cropland and rangeland, and we wanna get uh, uh, owners of all those properties in homegrown national park as well. There are 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens, not logging companies in the US. If they're managed properly by managing the invasives in those woodlots and by sustainably harvesting those woodlots, they all should be on homegrown national park. This is where our, our croplands are, 410 million acres are now in cropland, uh, big area, uh, but there are things that, that our, our farmers can do. We can restore the native plants on the edges of the fields, we can put in prairie strips, uh, we can restore uh, hedgerows that have been removed, and we can stop using neonicotinoid uh, pesticides. All of those things will vastly increase the biodiversity in our farmlands. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland, all of which could be good uh, uh, habitat if it's managed properly. We overgraze an awful lot of it. That, by the way, is four and a half times the size of Texas. If we restore the riparian carters that go through those rangelands, research is showing that that restores the biodiversity over the entire area. Um, very doable. Now, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. Uh, I learned this from, from um, one of my students in a class last semester. In a paper she wrote, she said, we, we claim to be managing species and habitats, but what we're really managing is people. And that's what we're talking about with Homegrown National Park. We're managing the people that own all of this land. It has been degraded because of the way we've treated our land, but we can also restore it. So we're talking about changing the culture. We've mentioned that, but it's so important. Right now, it's an adversarial relationship with nature. We must change it to a collaborative one if this is going to work. So what's, what's the rush? We're rapidly destroying the natural world that supports us. Our parks and preserves are not enough. So we've got to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on private property. Global conservation initiatives, they sound good on paper and the UN's talking about it, but we can't wait for them to actually uh, come up with, with actionable um, um, recommendations. We've been waiting for climate change and it's just not happening. Uh, so the power and responsibility of earth stewardship really resides in the individual, each one of us. That's a new message to most of the people on the planet. Our challenge is to make this a reality, to make it, make it part of our culture. Can we do it? I think we can. Uh, we don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but we can save it where we live. 
Uh, and if we're doing that, we certainly need to join Homegrown National Park. It empowers each one of us. You know, the, the Earth's problems are huge and most people feel absolutely powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can do all the things we just talked about. They can shrink the lawn, they can put in a pollinator garden, they can get rid of their invasive plants, they can turn out their lights, they can fire Mosquito Joe, they can, they can shrink the lawn, do all the things I forgot to tell you. One person can do that and totally revitalize the, their local ecosystem. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you, where you start. If you don't own property, you help somebody who does. So Aldo Leopold said a number of wonderful things. And, and one of them was, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. Now, I know he was talking about the emotional connection with nature. But actually, no one can live very long without wild things, for it's the wild things that keep us alive. Thank you for listening to that introduction. And we want to give you a chance to reflect on what you've heard and to introduce yourself to some of the other folks who are here. So Olivia, in a few minutes, is going to, to magically do what Zoom allows us to do, which is to be in a room with uh, two other people. And we'd like you to introduce yourself and share something that inspired you from this presentation and something that you heard that you think your congregation or community might be ready to take on in some form. Welcome back. I see people rejoining us. Welcome back, welcome back. You've been with us um, uh, almost 40, 45 minutes. So I'm gonna ask everybody just to stretch your arms up or stand up. Or shake out a little bit because I want you to be fully present to enjoy the rest of the program or your shoulders <laughs> back, whatever, whatever will be helpful. <clears throat> I'd also like to invite you to share any of your ideas or takeaways in the chat. If you're, if you're willing to do that, please do. But right now we're actually going to move on to practice. How do we make this work in real time at real places? And I want to say that there are, um, uh, there are two, I think, really excellent reasons to think about having a policy. And that's for our own health and safety. The, the image on the left talks about the toxins that we're exposed to every day. And according to the EPA, our off-road gasoline-powered equipment, such as lawnmowers and those famous leaf blowers, they emit approximately 242 million tons of pollutants. That sounds bad but it gets worse because that's just as much as our cars and our homes. So we believe strongly that one of the very first steps for all of us is to make a real effort to create a policy for our houses of worship, our schools, our retirement communities, seminaries, cemeteries, that is um, really claiming that we are committed to ecological land stewardship. And I'm just gonna name here that most policies have a very general structure. There's always an overview, which is your value statement and what your intentions are. The scope, which tells you and the community, how much of your land are you gonna to dedicate to this work and uh, uh, over what period of time. And then there's usually four areas that are specific procedures. Plantings, what's in, what's out. You heard Doug tell me talk about his recommendations there. Chemical use, in or out water use, priority on conservation, and equipment. Let's remember that slide about shifting from fossil fuels to electric or something that gets the pollutants out of the air. So I'm going to introduce now Roy Mano, who is the facilities director of um, Kenna Crossland Community in Kenna in Pennsylvania. We're thrilled to have him because he can give us some real world experience, both about policies and how some of this looks in real life. So welcome, Roy. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Oh, thank you very much, Paula. And I'm really happy to be here. And I'm glad that you made us all stretch for a minute because now I have the opportunity of having everyone stay awake while I share my little bit of insight with uh, what we're talking about tonight. So thank you all for having me as part of the group. As Paula said, I'm the director of facilities for Kendall Crossland's communities. And in that role, 
I oversee the maintenance department, the grounds department, resident transportation, and uh, essentially what we call our um, campus responders, which are light maintenance and security, or rather safety, I should say. Um, Kendall Crossland's Communities is actually a continuing care retirement community, and our organization is made up of four separate communities, uh, two that are very large, um, consisting of about 500 um, residents on each campus, spread out between uh, skilled nursing, assisted living, and independent living, and then on our two smaller campuses, being Cartmel and Coniston, we have um, over 50 communities. And, and actually the average age in both of those communities is about 80 years old. So even though it's over 50, we've kind of exceeded that uh, target. Um, we have about 102,000 square feet of occupied space and our communities live on 500 acres of property. So we've got quite a lot of uh, ground to cover. 85 of those acres are wooded areas. Uh, and in those wooded areas, we have 14 trails and 26 acres of those 85 acres are what we call spray fields, uh, where we um, spray the water from our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we purify the water and then uh, water it into the wooded areas. Um, we have 276 what we call natural areas throughout the communities. And that's anything from a small garden to a large meadow. Uh, I mentioned the wastewater treatment plant. We are a certified arboretum and our ground staff are, as we all are, very proud of that uh, designation and they do a lot of work to maintain that. Um, related to our grounds team and more specifically for this group, one of the key components of what we do in maintaining our grounds and our natural areas, uh, we have several really key committees and those committees are made up by residents as well as administrative members, you know, members of the management team and other workforce members. And we're fortunate that we have a really vibrant group of residents that really care about these things and in, in many ways keep us motivated as a management team to make sure that we're, you know, following the best practices or at least en endeavoring to take good care and be good stewards of our, our extended grounds. So of those committees, we have the, the four community big woods. And as the name kind of depicts, they really work on and are responsible for the big woods, the 85 acres. We have the Nur Nature Conservancy Committee, which is really the, um, the natural areas. We have the Horticultural Committee and the Arboretum Committee. We have a trails committee, we have a hydroponics team and a small hydroponics garden that they're hoping to grow. And of course we have waste committees um, really detailing our recycling efforts. And again, all of those committees are heavily staffed by our residents, which um, you know keep the passion for all this stuff going. Next slide, please. So I'd like to talk a little bit about policy development. Um, as you can imagine, with a large organization like Kendall Crosslands, we do need a lot of policies. Um, in addition to policies, there's procedures that make those policies living documents that really have an effect on everything that we do. Uh, we try not to overburden our residents and, quite frankly, ourselves with too many policies. So, you know, we have um, reasoning and logic behind when and why to develop a policy. In that process, we try to determine who the stakeholders are, you know, because they need to be involved in the process of developing a policy. We gather the pertinent information and then we develop the policy. And I'm gonna share the specifics around these four steps that we try to follow as we develop policies. So the first part is identifying the need. Why do we need this policy? Is it relevant to our mission? Will it help us achieve a specific goal? Will it allow us to conform to the requirements that we feel are needed for having this policy? Will it inform others? In other words, you know, just writing this policy and implementing a policy, will it help others understand 
the needs of the organization. And in this particular case, when we're talking about our grounds and our landscape, will it help our residents understand why these particular actions are being implemented through a policy, why they're important, why, why, why it might be ecologically friendly, why we might need to do something that may not seem to make sense from an ecological standpoint, but from a science standpoint, we need to do it. Um, and then the last part is if we implement a policy, kind of a strong word, is it enforceable? Um, you know, and being a manager, I, <laughs> I tend to move in that direction. So um, it is a bit of a strong word, but, you know, interpret it in the sense that, you know, is it practical? Will we willingly, as a group, as a community, adhere to the policy? Um, and I think it's important to recognize, too, you know, while a policy is in place to be followed and adhered to, policies also are living, breathing documents that can be changed, not on a whim, but on a need or on a changing circumstance. And that should be discussed and reviewed. And policies are reviewed typically annually in case changes need to be made. So we talked about stakeholders. Who's the policy for? Who wants the policy? Who's it important to? And then really most importantly, who is it gonna affect? And in that case, how does it affect the community? Whether it's a community like the one that I, I work in, or it's a school organization or a church or a membership group, you know, there are stakeholders and people that this will impact. So it could be staff, it could be residents, it could be members, it could be visitors to your organization. And it could be all of the above and certainly constituent groups that I've not even listed. Next slide, please. Gather pertinent information. So as I said, why do we need this policy? The information that we'll gather in developing it because it starts with an idea or a suggestion or something that comes up at a meeting or a, um, you know, a group discussion or a couple of individuals. So it's coming from somewhere. So is it relevant? Is it gonna, again, tie back to the mission of the organization or the group? Um, is it achievable? Is there a goal? Is there an end in mind? Um, you know, and policies can be general and can be broad. Um, the procedures are when you might get into more specifics, but it is good to have an end in mind for what the policy is setting out to do. Um, we wanna make sure that whatever the requirements are of that policy, they're reasonably, they're, there's a reasonable ability to conform with the policy. Uh, we don't wanna be you know, a police state, but we wanna have policies that everyone can generally be familiar with or understand if they need to look up a policy to see what the case might be. Um, and we want it to be, um, informing. Okay, developing the policy. Well, as I think everyone in the group is, we're a Quaker-based organization, so we always try to follow our Quaker values, simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. And when I was preparing this discussion and I thought about um, some of these values, I think simplicity and integrity really speak for themselves. And I thought, well, how do you relate peace to a policy? And I thought that um, agreeable was a good word to go along with that. So the policy should you know, be agreeable to the, you know, most of, of the people that are being involved in it. I don't think we can always get everyone to agree, but you know, if we can get most people or at least gain an understanding from most people of why we need the policy. And stewardship, you know, that's a big one. That's really why we're here talking about these things. So the policy should include the purpose, definitions related to the policy, what the policy statement is, and then the procedures that make the policy an actionable document. Next slide, please. Okay, so when we develop a policy for our landscaping decision, whether it's grounds or landscaping or anything that we're doing out of doors, quite frankly, um, you know, we take into consideration four key things on the environmental side. Is it ecologically or environmentally uh, or naturally the responsible thing to do? We don't want to cause any harm. That can be really difficult in 
I was going to say in a large organization, but in any organization, especially when you're dealing with infrastructure, there's times when you have to do um, construction type work. You have to dig things up. You have to build structures, et cetera. And, you know, from a natural perspective standpoint, that does cause harm. But of course, you want to minimize that harm. Um, we want to protect native species. We have a big push in our um, big wood areas. And this year, we're working on a project of eliminating invasive species and replanting um, native species. So a big effort going on with that. We got a lot of good stuff going on there. And we want to enhance for us, because we're a continuing care retirement community, we want to make sure that the policy, if we can, is enhancing the resident life experience at Kendall Crosslands. So from idea to need to implementation, the way we do it is once the idea lands on the table, we pull a committee together. Sometimes and oftentimes we go to the existing committees, share the information with them, and the dialogue begins. We'll often hold listening sessions because while it may start as something that's important to a couple of individuals or a small group, we really always try to look at it as what's the impact on the entire community or the entire organization or the large group of stakeholders. So we hold listening sessions where everybody has an opportunity to gather. And of course, these days, still coming off the pandemic, we do it both in person and what we call hybrid. So we'll have people in the room and people on Zoom. Um, so everyone gets an opportunity to contribute. Uh, then we have we make sure on the administrative side that we follow up. So everybody's informed. They know what is happening with the policy. They know why it's happening. They know what the plans are. And again, there's opportunities for feedback and so on. Um, Subcommittees typically may get involved. We may seek funding, and the funding can come from uh, different venues in our organization. Uh, we have capital budgets on an annual basis. We have different, um, trying to think of the right words, but uh, programs wherein our residents or others can uh, make donations to different projects that might be um, on the calendar for the coming year or the following year. Um, we seek grants and other opportunities. We are a nonprofit. And um, again, we keep everybody informed. And in that process of informing the community, we try to educate everyone about the different topics that we're, we're dealing with. So we feel like we have a good productive process in developing our policies and procedures. And I feel like we've been pretty successful with that. Next slide, please. So from a practical standpoint or an action item standpoint uh, related to our landscaping policies and procedures, um, on the resident side, we have policies related to modifications and additions, and this is all outside. So if you move into one of our cottages, you have a designated garden space, which we help you with. Um, you also have a natural area right outside your cottage, which you can participate in, and we have policies around that. We have community gardens, which are large spaces on each of um, really all four campuses where residents can go and, and, and have a larger garden space where they can grow vegetables or exotic plants or whatever they might feel like doing. Um, we have blacktop pathways that traverse the um, larger communities that are not part of the natural tra trails in the woods. We have covered walkways so our residents can go about and not have to get wet in the rain, and we have policies covering those areas. We have landscaped common areas, and we have a no whimsy policy, which I thought was real interesting when I first got there, um, you know, because we have so many trees, and you know the natural progression with a tree is occasionally they die, and we have to remove them. And I had the bright idea of why don't we carve something into the the remaining. Uh, stump of the tree and add some decoration and make it a, um, a destination, like a walking point for our residents to go see something, because we're very much about keeping everybody ambulatory. And my ground supervisor said, Roy, that's a great idea, but we have a no whimsy policy. So what that policy speaks to is um, we don't want 
we want everything to really be as natural as it can be. So while you can do some, uh, if I can say it this way, minor decorating in your private garden adjacent to your, your cottage, out in the natural areas, we really want it to remain natural and retain its natural beauty and not try to add to it artificially. Uh, from the community standpoint, of course, snow removal, uh, but stormwater management is a big part of what we do. Our original community was built 50 years ago. So you can imagine back then there were no regulations uh, um, uh, enforcing any kind of stormwater management. So we do a lot of catch up work and revitalization with that. Uh, we have ecologically friendly um, pest management and we recycle our grounds waste material as well. We have other um, recycling programs, but I thought that one was uh, a good mention for this group. Um, and then we also purchase clean energy. We're probably only doing about 10% of our energy as clean purchase at this point, but we do have um, contracts that we renew um, every couple of years and we're constantly looking for more opportunity to do that. We're just getting into solar energy. We've installed our first, on a, on a small scale, uh, sets of solar panels, and we're looking to continue that. Um, I've mentioned recycling a couple of times. We do have a good number of geothermal um, heating systems, um, heating several of our um, cottages and, and homes the wastewater treatment plant and a small hydroponics operation. So we have really a lot going on and a lot of policies built around these things. And, and I hope that you guys all found that helpful. I enjoyed talking about it. So thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Roy. Uh, I realized that I, I'm not sure I can look at my, at the chat and continue to do what I'm doing in terms of screen sharing. So we only have four minutes, but if somebody, if uh, Olivia or Ruth, then either take a peek or someone can raise their hand. We have we have time for maybe two questions, two short questions. Does anyone have something they'd like to ask more about, either in terms of policy or in terms of, of this as an example? I don't see any questions in the chat yet, Paula. So maybe we could just ask people to raise their hand, either electronically or Okay. vigorously on the screen. Also, let me just say, any questions that are put in the chat, we'll do our best to get answers for. And when we send out the recording we'll and, and the resource list, we will do our best to answer them. Paula, if I could just add, it, feel free to share my email address. So if anyone has a question after the uh, presentation, they can email me and I'd be happy to get an answer to them. Great. I see Paul, thank you. I see Paul Indorf has his hand up. Paul, do you want to ask your question? Paul, and then Lauren, if there's time. If not, we'll, we'll get the answer for you. Paul, we don't hear you if you're speaking. All right, Lauren, you want to hop in and we'll see if we can connect with Paul later. Am I, am I there? Oh, there you are. There you are. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, um, I was just thinking, uh, Meetings I'm associated with by a large amount of uh, you know football football field size um, graveyards that are grass and religiously mowed, and I'm wondering if there is uh, some way to approach that uh, in terms of maybe overplanting something, mowing higher, uh, or making those more uh, sustainable. I can tell you, at Kendall Crossland's. Uh, two things that we've done, we're moving from grass areas to meadows, um, an initiative that started probably about five years ago, and we're making good progress with it. We have a long way to go, but we have a good plan and we have a strong team. So that's been a big help. And last year, I introduced our first robotic lawnmower to start impacting our uh, reduction of gas powered equipment for our, our groundskeeping team. And that's been a huge success. And one of the benefits of that um, robotic lawnmower is it's helping control our geese population. Thank you. Um, Paul, I think you're making also a good point about that. And I think there are a number of projects underway to model alternatives to that. And that might be a follow up to this series is to do something specifically around cemeteries. Thank you for bringing that up. Lauren, is it a quick question? I'll give it a try. 
Yeah, it can be. I was just curious if um, Kendall Crossland's had any particular, particularly articulated goals, like by 2030, we're going to change X or change Y. Like what are the big areas of change that you're um, um, measuring somehow? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, we're trying to really define what the long-term goals are related to um, not only our natural areas and our ecological impact, but our energy usage as well. Um, our, we have an energy committee, which I didn't mention here, and they're pushing very hard for um, you know, a carbon-free landscape at Kendall Crosslands. So administration and the energy committee and other committees there are working very hard on defining what that really means for us and how we can achieve that. So we don't have a definitive answer. And I, in talking with Paula the other day, I mentioned that for us at Kendall Crossens, right now, it's very much a journey. And we have a glimpse of the destination, but we haven't defined it yet. Meaning that, you know, our, our journey on this um, conservation path is very much underway but we have a way to go in defining what that really means for us. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you so much, Roy. We're gonna transition now um, to spend the last period of time, and of course I'm having trouble again, sorry. There we go, to the certification programs. And tonight we're gonna to watch a 14 minute explanation of the greening sacred grounds. And I'm gonna open it right now. I happen to be an environmentalist and I want to really emphasize the opportunity that we have at my church, because we have four and a half acres, to take care of the environment. We there has been a big movement to green congregations and the faith community has really embraced this and taken this on and there's been a huge effort to green the inside of the congregation. Sacred Grounds is one of the first programs to really focus on the outside of the congregation, to talk about greening the grounds, which are obviously a very important component of a congregation. And we're going to have workshops for them where they can come and learn about how to create wildlife habitat. We're going to teach them how to do soil samples, what native plants to put in the ground, how to prevent stormwater runoff on their property. We're going to teach them a variety of on-the-ground techniques. Push the soil around. This which will help them create better habitat for wildlife and ultimately people. I'm going to talk about attracting wildlife, particularly birds and butterflies, to your congregation grounds. So National Wildlife Federation for many, many decades now has had a program called Gardening for Wildlife. Our goal is to help people and to help wildlife. This program helps people Garden for Wildlife, where they live, work, play, learn, and now worship. Again, because of Rabbi Fred Dobb, we are encouraged to create a program specifically for congregations, and you're seeing the unveiling of this program. We've reached lots of people. People have perhaps seen some of the signs. We've done lots of work. We have many, many people who have certified their backyards, their schools, their businesses, and a variety of other places as wildlife habitat. We do this because the parks alone that many people think of as important for wildlife, and they are, Yosemite, Yellowstone, Sligo Creek, you know, the local to the national, are all very significant in helping wildlife, but it is not enough. We have done so much damage to so much habitat, and there's much more on the way because of climate change, that we need to see our suburban and urban areas as an opportunity to restore wildlife habitat. We know that we can make a difference right in our backyards and right on our congregation grounds. One example is a monarch butterfly that has declined by 90%. We all know the monarch butterfly. It's, a, it's an iconic species. And we can restore it by simply planting milkweed. It takes about at least 10 plants scattered in your yard or on your gra congregation grounds, and you can make a difference for monarch. That is something that we can all do. 
And we can help bring this back. There's much more that needs to be done. It's not going to be quite that simple, but that is one of the pieces of it. We have three main goals with this program. Wildlife habitat, water conservation, and preparing and coping with climate change. If you choose to do all these things and you want recognition for it, you can go through a certification program that we have. You can buy a sign and you can get a certification to hang. If you choose to, you can of course do all these things and just do them for the good of wildlife as well. We chose to do sacred grounds because there's a lot of land actually. And if we can restore this from lawns to native meadows and rain gardens, we can do something significant for wildlife. We also can reach a lot of people at once by doing something here. We hope you can reach the demonstration site for all the members. We have 500 families that are part of this congregation. We're hoping that many of them will take this idea and do it back home. And lastly, as we know, congregations are community leaders, that the people who uh, are the that run the congregations, that speak for the congregations, are often very connected within their communities, in their neighborhoods, within other communities, and they're, they're ambassadors in a very positive way. And as people of faith, you can really, with a very clear message, share this information. So you have to do four things, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. Water is one simple thing you can do, of course, is put up a bird bath. Place to raise young at a dot shalom, we had a girl make a bat house box. You can put up, we also have bluebird boxes and screech owl boxes that we're going to be putting up here. She did that as part of her SSL uh, credit. Cover is easy. You know, you just want to give animals a place to hide, essentially, from other animals, <laughs> sometimes people. And, you know, things like rock piles are good for lizards. Leaf litter, leaving some leaves on the ground is very important for salamanders. Uh, brush piles are important for wrens. A lot of people have wrens in their yard, or if you, if you have a wood pile or a brush pile, you'll have those wrens right there. The last one is the most important, and that's food. Not all plants are created equal. Native plants are better, and I'm going to help show you why. Plants, of course, are the foundation for the food web, the web of life. If you have plants, then you'll have insects. The insects have co-evolved with the plants so that 90% of them, 90% of our insects, which are the ba one of the basic next pieces of the food web, only can live off of the plants that they've grown up with over time. Only those plants. So people like to think about taking care of birds by feeding them seeds and such, which is great can be a great thing to do, but it's more for our entertainment, frankly. It's not so much that the birds need it. What they need are caterpillars. They need lots and lots and lots of caterpillars. 96% of birds rely on them to feed their young during the nesting season, which is just starting now. For example, a chickadee almost exclusively feeds on caterpillars. So how many caterpillars does it take? So this is what Dr. Doug Tallamy and others have found. He's a professor, an entomology professor over in University of Delaware. A pair of chickadees, which feed their young, can deliver food about every three minutes. This is how many caterpillars they can deliver in 27 minutes. This is how many they need per day. They spend 16 days before they're ready to fly. This is how many it takes within that short period of time. 6,000 to 9,000, that's a huge number of caterpillars. That's building a better bird feeder. So one of the things Dr. Tallamy has found is he's ranked and found out which plants are more important in the sense that they are host to that many more caterpillars. If you look at the oak and compare it with the beech, these are all native trees. If you really want to create a bird feeder, you want to think about an oak tree. But if you go on and look at that and you compare that to Bradford pear, right? That's an example of a tree that many are planted commonly in cityscapes. Look at the difference. You know, it's hardly one caterpillar compared to 233 caterpillars, right? Shocking. Same thing with uh, flowering herbaceous plants. Goldenrod, asters, very important. Other black-eyed Susans, a beautiful one, also important. 
the data do show that native plants are much better. I can show you oodles more information, but this is just an example. We've created, working with the Forest Service and the University of Delaware, uh, an, an app that will be uh, unveiled in January that will allow anybody to put their zip code in and it will print out or pop up all the best native plants that you can put. We have this, some of this data already for the Mid-Atlantic. He's doing this for the whole entire country to really help create this native plant movement. And hopefully people will walk in with that app with their smartphone into you know, a, na a nursery and say, this is what I want. This does not provide wildlife habitat. <laughs> And we can do more. We can actually create functioning, productive habitats in our urban, suburban communities. We started with the Sacred Grounds Project working with three congregations. We worked with Adat Shalom. You're going to see an example and hear from a couple of people at Adat Shalom. We also worked with a Lutheran church, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, and uh, a Baptist church in Anacostia, working with Interfaith Power and Light and, the, and a grant from the National Park Service. We tried this out. At the Lutheran Church, they had a great program. Uh, man on the top, <laughs> he uh, with his, is holding his, sitting there with his young child, and he taught a creation care class in his preschool. And then he brought the kids outside and showed them he made mud puddles on their property for butterflies to get water during, the, during their migratory period. But when he brought the kids out, the parents came. Of course, right? You can't leave those little toddlers alone. So he got all these parents along to learn about it, and he put up some nest boxes. And then he uh, gave them all a little pot and gave them some native seeds and to bring home and start their own gardens at home. It was, he was brilliant. He did a really amazing job at this church. And then we worked with a church over in Anacostia, and this was the winter, so you can't, it doesn't look exciting yet, and then here's what they began with. They decided to create their, garden, their sacred ground space right in their entrance. They wanted everyone from their congregation to see it. The bottom is Reverend Banks and his wife. Reverend Banks is an amazing pastor. He has, really has a strong love for the environment, and he's already become, he's been an ambassador for things like wind power and other things, but he's become an ambassador and willing to be a much bigger ambassador for this program within the Baptist community. And he is a strong advocate for this, and his congregation turned out in big numbers to help create this garden. One of the things that we learned at Adat Shalom is that there's an opportunity to connect, very importantly, with, a, with county, in this case, Montgomery County's Rainscapes program. We had decided that we would uh, pick a site to put our garden in a big stormwater basin, which has always been an eyesore for the congregation. Again, people were thinking about the inside of the grounds, but not the outside. Here's a big stormwater basin, and if you look at the next picture, you can see why it's a stormwater basin that Rabbi Fred took this picture one day. This is for the 100-year floods, which are now, of course, much more frequent than they are really not 100 years anymore, and it does fill up with that. But before, we had it with just simply you know, lawn type of materials. And we found out, if we can connect with the county, that we could actually transform that area, not just into wildlife habitat, but into a rain garden with the intention of absorbing more water and more pollutants. And in doing so, we would help our watershed, but we also could get a financial rebate to do this work. And we'll hear a lot more about that. But we have now decided at Sacred Grounds that we are going to look for similar programs all over the country to match up because I'll show you some of the costs. So at Adat Shalom, you can see there again Rabbi Fred and my son came along and we got all the kids to come along and we put in 2,500 native plants in 2,500 square feet. Actually, we, and we did some more others planting around here. We got a huge turnout. You'll hear more about that. We got 60 people to come and help us do the planting. The Rainscapes program allowed us to do that. Montgomery County Rainscapes program provided a $6,000 refund to pay for our plants, our mulch, our compost, and we allowed us to hire a landscaper to take out all of that lawn. That's a huge figure. This is an example of some of the flowers that came up. So lastly, I'm just going to show you we, the certification program. Besides doing the food cover water or places to raise young, we have a couple of faith aspects to it. But we're still playing with this, but there's three main elements. There's a connecting faith and the environmental stewardship through the congregational leadership. Having a sermon, 
doing it through your uh, religious education. We did a lot of work with our Torah school here and then using, using the site as an actual sacred space. Secondly, part of the application certification, if you choose to go through that recognition of it, is to actually educate, engage, and inspire the congregation at the site through all kinds of things like newsletters, information tables, you could do stuff on your website, and then taking action to actually do a planting day to do a workshop on teaching people on how to do it at home and do a blessing of the space. And the very last one is beyond the congregation. We would encourage people to actually take this out to either within your faith or at an interfaith or within your neighborhood to do like a garden tour for the neighbors. Write a newsletter article, the man with the Lutheran church, he wrote an article that went out through a variety of Lutheran networks, you know, way beyond just his own church and his own neighborhood and his own area, region. And there's all kinds of ways that we can help spread the word. I believe this is St. Francis, a really nice point is one is nearer to God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. And that's what we're trying to create is, again, bring people outside to have a connection with nature right on congregation grounds, to feel the spirit of nature right here on your grounds. And I think we can create that easily by encouraging people to take these steps. So I'm just going to take uh, two minutes here at the end to share what, the, what you'll find at the National Wildlife Federation's website, which I hope everyone will take a look at this week. There are plenty of sites, but there's one page that gives you a summary of the required elements that we heard about, food, water, cover, places to raise young. They have a site specifically for schoolyard habitats. I worked for about 15 years at West Elm School, Quaker School in, in uh, Chester County. And I worked with this program, it's excellent. I really encourage you to take a look at it. If, even if you just have a preschool at your church or meeting house, take a look at it and see how, how to involve uh, children of all ages. They also have a web page that has these tip sheets, guides, and videos. I mean, just more information than you could even imagine. If you look on the left-hand side, it gives you the native plant type. She mentioned nectar plants for monarchs, regional examples host plants by eco-region, and then the keystone plants by eco-region. It's all there for us. Then in addition, we're all going to need some landscaping help from somebody. And they've, they've worked with an online company that you can take a look at. But also think about who in your community are master gardeners, a watershed association, if you have any kind of, of water on your property. And depending on your state, I listed the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, but there are many organizations that can point you to great landscapers. In addition to uh, our area, the Mid-Atlantic, we have some very excellent nurseries here, but they've also set up a, a door dash for you around native plant collection. So you can also take a look at what it costs and getting plants delivered. And then finally, if you do choose to ha uh, certify, as she mentioned, it's only $20, uh, it, it's not a big financial commitment. And they will ask you to complete a form that tells you how you address the four areas that are really important for a habitat, as well as how you've done any outreach or work with your community. She mentioned several of them. So I'd like to name some of the things I've seen um, come through in the chat that I looked at earlier and some of my own takeaways to wrap up. Uh, that nature's not optional. Who, 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 who knew? Nature is not optional. That small changes really matter. That we don't really have any time to lose. That nature is actually responsive. That life wants to work with us. That we can actually heal ourselves as we heal nature. And that we are, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we are so lucky living in the Mid-Atlantic where we have great resources available to us. We kind of don't have any excuses here. And that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can follow those who've gone before us and created a structure and process that works, which leads us to the last comment, which is we hope you'll join us again to learn about the Audubon program, which is uh, similar, but a little different from the program from the National Wildlife Federation and the details about actually how to register for the homegrown national park on April 5th. 
I'd like to encourage Roy, if he hasn't, to think about getting Kendall Crosslands on that map with everyone else. And many of us uh, already qualify for that. So I hope you're beginning to believe that together we can make our houses of worship, our schools, our retirement communities, our cemeteries, our farms, our seminaries, our retreat centers, models of ecological landscaping. So on behalf of the Eco Justice Collaborative and the Concord Quarter Climate Action Working Group, the Chester County Interfaith Action Committee, the Westchester Area Green Teams Living Landscapes and the Westtown Environmental Advisory Council, I'd like to thank you for joining us and I hope we'll see you again in April. Thank you very much for coming tonight.